I'm so excited because I will be interviewing Professor David Brockley, the former president of the Institute of Structural Engineer. One of the reasons I'm so excited for you to see this video is so that you can take away the lesson of how you can use your own knowledge, skills and experience as a nurse, but combine it with something that you're curious about or passionate about, as Professor Blockley has done with his new book. So do watch till the end, because there will be some practical tips as well as examples from the book and the pillars that we can take away as nurses. What I really wanted you to see is the possibility of creating something exciting and new using your own um, experience but tying it in with something that you're curious about so stay tuned and watch till the so, end. Hi everybody and welcome back to the channel my name is Sabrina Phillips and today I've got the privilege of interviewing Professor David Blockley about his new book entitled Climate Change is an Opportunity or Why We Need principle of capitalism and David's going to tell us how we came up with the idea for the book but also some of the principles or framework um, within the book that you can take away and act on. So without further ado David would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you Sabrina that's very kind of you. Thank you for inviting me onto your channel. Anyway um, I guess I should start by saying I'm first and foremost an engineer but in the last few years I've been developing a strong interest and a little knowledge about microeconomics and of course like everyone else I'm concerned about climate change. Now, after I graduated I worked in industry for a while before moving into academia here in Bristol University. Uh, I'm still an emeritus professor. Now uh, when I joined the university in the 1970s there had been some big engineering failures. It's probably too long ago for you to remember, Sabrina, but um, there were, in the 1970s, there were some rather spectacular box girder bridge collapses. Uh, in, and in 1968, an explosion had destroyed the Ronan block of flats in London. And before that, a cooling tower at Ferry Bridge Station, power station, in 1965 collapsed rather dramatically. And not only those, there were lots more. So I began to study the reasons. Uh, I began to see what we do and why things go wrong. Now, engineers are trained to think about the technical issues. They were the trigger events. The failures had accumulated or incubated over a period of time through human and social interaction. Uh, the analogy I use is a bit like blowing up a balloon. Each puff of air as you blow into it represents something that's not quite right. For example, poor decision making, lack of control, people in the wrong job. Uh, and if that is something is spotted, we can let the air out and relieve the situation. But if the puffs accumulate and you end up with a very large, tight, taut balloon. That represents the accident waiting to happen because all you need is a pinprick and it bursts the balloon and you get a large release of energy and you trigger a collapse. That's really interesting. Um, as you were talking about the balloon analogy, I was just thinking about healthcare and how sometimes things that we do every day or they line up perfectly to create an issue or end up in what we might call an incident, we call it the Swiss cheese analogy so you know how swiss cheese has got holes in it yeah, yeah if you line yeah. it up perfectly the li the then line it, up, yeah. yeah and part of sometimes some of the things we try to do in healthcare is break that line up so that we can spot when then things go wrong so i think there's a lot of um synergies in some well that cheese analogy was developed by james reason that's i psychologist um, i worked with a social scientist called barry turner mm -hmm. who whose ideas were predated James Reason, but the balloon idea stems mm -hmm. from Barry's idea of uh, incubating uh, events and, and interactions. Um, as you said, you're an engineer by background, but you also develop different interests, especially around systems thinking. And we did um, write a paper together. You, you did mention you're a professor, you're an academic, but you also have written a number of books on yeah. engineering. And what motivated you to start writing and just to uh, about the things that you have written? Well, early in my career, I, I wrote uh, because to other engineers. I wanted them to understand that their subject wasn't just 
technical. It's a much broader. I, when I um, taught engineering, we never mentioned people at all. It was all about things and, you know, the physics yeah. and the, the, um, the science of, in my case, because I'm a structural engineer in the way that uh, structures work. So we focused on the steel and the concrete and all the forces inside. Never a mention of people, really. As soon as I moved into industry, I realized that it's all about people. <laughs> you know, you're part of a team and you've yeah. got to work with other people. And if it all goes wrong, then the project goes wrong. And in fact, the although uh, in investigating these failures like Rolling Point, people had focused on the technical things, they were missing the um, social and organizational issues. I also, in reading about risk, and it was treated as a math piece of mathematics, uh, there was virtually no philosophy behind it all. One of the rare people who did understand this was actually my predecessor, mm -hmm. who, whose name was uh, Sir Alfred Pugsley. He was one of the people that investigated Ronan Point. He wrote a paper called the the climatology of structural accidents, which showed how political pressures and uh, professional issues and, and all sorts of social things affected the outcome of a major engineering project. And in the NHS, of course, you, you've got a <laughs> project writ large mm -hmm. because it's such a complex organisation. In studying why things go wrong, uh, I came to see a lack of philosophy, and it, it eventually uh, I, it dawned on me that it was a systems problem. And systems theory had been developed in the late uh, part of last century, but itself wasn't very system systemic because there were so many different ideas and theories about what a system is and how it works. And it ranged from the mathematical side, uh, where people were treating it as a mathematical problem, right through to the social sciences. And Barry Turner was a good example, and James Reason, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, they didn't really have an underlying philosophy. Um, that's what I set about trying to write about. So my first book was in 1980, called The Nature of Structural Design and Safety. And then I edited a volume called Engineering Safety, uh, where I got all these people together. Um, we got, uh, Barry uh, wrote one chapter. Uh, one of my research assistants, Nick Pigeon, who is now a professor of psychology at the uh, University of Cardiff, he wrote another chapter. And I had some really technical chapters too. Perhaps it was too technical because it, didn't, uh, it wasn't a big seller. <laughs> and eventually... Both of those books have gone out of print, um, but they are available on my website. If you yeah. Google David Blockley blog, then you'll find a page where you can download those books if you wish to. Um, I'm not saying they're easy reading. <laughs> um, then after that, I, I, I was invited to write the Penguin Dictionary of Civil Engineering, which I really enjoyed doing because mm -hmm. I had to research all sorts of uh, words that... Uh, uh, I wasn't sure what they really meant. Uh, and that's been quite successful mm -hmm. uh, with Penguin. And then I retired in 2005, and I determined that I would try to explain to people what engineering was about. Um, so I, I, I wrote uh, a, a book about bridges, Oxford University Press. Oh, and I forgot one. Yeah. Um, in, 19, in the 1990s, I met a guy called uh, Patrick Godfrey, who worked at Halcro Consulting Engineers. And uh, unbeknown to him, he was a systems thinker. He'd never understood that. He just mm -hmm. did it naturally. And uh, he'd had quite a, an extensive career in the oil industry, particularly. Uh, and when, as soon as I met him, I invited him to Bristol to talk to the students. And he was a great big hit. He really yeah. went down well because the students appreciated this was from the horse's mouth. In the end, uh, he actually retired when I retired from Halcro and became a professor at uh, university, kind mm. of succeeded me. 
And together we wrote a book called Doing It Differently, which won the prize for the char from the Chartered Institute of Building. I'm quite proud of that book. Well, um, that's still in print. That's still in print. <laughs> Uh, and it's published by uh, Thomas Telford Limited, who part of the Institute of Civil Engineers. I think Thomas Telford is, is, is no more, is now ICE Publications, but the book is still available. Um, and I know a lot of people outside of civil engineering have read it, Mm -hmm. Because it's really about system. It was in response to uh, an inquiry into the construction industry as to why it wasn't delivering on time and on budget. Yeah. Nothing like the NHS in terms of complexity. Yeah. Um, I mean, a big project like the um, Terminal 5 at Heathrow, mm -hmm. which was largely due to Patrick, was um, it, his input was a success, despite there being a little problem at the end with the baggage handling facility. But if you compare that to the um, German airport, um, I've forgotten its name, uh, which was over budget by a large amount and um, over time. Um, <coughs> now, uh, building an airport is actually quite a complex project. But it's nothing like as complex as the uh, NHS. So we started thinking about the difference between rather straight problem where you know what you're doing, you've got a clear task ahead of you, like, um, well, I like doing a blood test. You know, mm -hmm. everybody who, if you're a nurse, you're trained to do a blood test and there's no real problem over doing it other than sometimes finding a difficult vein in the arm of the patient. Yeah. Um, I've had that experience. <laughs> um, you know, when, when you think at higher levels in the organisation, the uh, distribution of resources, interfaces, I think one of the big problems of the NHS is sharing data. And I think it's a tragedy that uh, different trusts are developing different computer. And as I understand it, if the, the, uh, a patient moves from, say, where I am in Bristol and, and it ends up in Glasgow and it, it's ill, people in Glasgow would find great difficulty in getting hold of the data about the patient. And that seems to me a national disgrace. I mean, there should be some uh, overall um, planning and development of an integrated system. Uh, because that's what systems is about, integration. It's about joined up thinking. The other event that will be close to you, Sabrina, is the um, case of Victoria Columbia many years ago. Yeah. A child that died from abuse. Um, that impacted on me. It was the very first time I realised the parallel. Uh, in fact, I wanted to include it in one of my books, but the mm -hmm. publisher said it's not engineering enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't put it in. But it's a pity because um, the, there is a direct parallel. What you've got are the different agencies seeing different parts of the problem. It's a, bit like the, it's a bit like the story of the blind man, who, the blind men, rather, mm -hmm. who each approach an elephant, feels the leg, one feels the trunk, one feels the tail, one feels the body, and they all conclude different things about what the object is. Uh, you can't get the idea of an elephant unless you see the whole. And in Victoria Columbia's case, evidence wasn't put together. So the whole picture wasn't identified. And there have been lots and lots of other social, the, the, the case of baby P. Yeah. I, I remember the mur murder of, uh, murderer Ian Huntley. Uh, all sorts of cases right across the spectrum where there was lack of integration. And uh, that's what systems is. Now, I, I've written five axioms of systems, which is on my website, if anybody's interested to look at them. But um, that, that was the basis to uh, the final book uh, that, um, that we're talking about today, which, of course, is about the most important problem mm -hmm. that we humans have ever faced, climate yeah. change. In the news, we see the catastrophic effects of the climate change already. 
mm-hmm. uh, recent f- wildfires across the whole yeah. world, floods in China have been seen recently in the news. What impacts on me and a lot of people is to see the melting iceberg, the changing season, effects of the rise in uh, sea level, the loss of wildlife. Uh, all these problems have not really been internalized, is the word I use. Mm-hmm. Not really grasped by many people, and particularly our political leaders. Uh, and by internalised, I mean really, really see the dangers that we face. Not, uh, we're talking about climate change all the time. I don't think people really got hold of how serious it is. And so I wanted to write about that. The reason why economics is holding us back uh, and There's a lot about that in the book. But of course, importantly, we have to recognize the world is divided as never before. Uh, You know, USA, China, the West, Mm -hmm. uh, we just mistrust each other. The picture I'm painting is that uh, we've got to recognize we're all citizens of the planet. There are people who are promoting this idea, and in particular one of the books, uh, and there's a website written by a guy called John Alexander, it provides us with a new opportunity, because we will realise the imperative is so strong, we've got to get over our division. Now that sounds idealistic and improbable, but we've got to find our new faith in humankind, I think. And what I say is that corruption in the book, uh, Mm -hmm. corruption, crime, wars, are ways of gaining an advantage over others, which just seem like squabbling and rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. I hope that will hit home to some people. Perhaps it won't. But no matter what our disagreements about the way we live, we have to live together and we have to come to an agreement about this one issue, climate change, if we're to survive. I mean, it's going to affect Russia, it is affecting China, it obviously affects every, all the countries in the West, because we hear mm. about that. We don't hear about what's going on in Russia, for example. So that, there's a lot that you've said there, David, in terms of how you moved from academia into writing, but also you're going from being an engineer and writing essentially about economics but with the view of how countries' economics can support what we deliver from a climate change perspective or um, things that we can start taking action on. Because there's something about us being global citizens. And I think for me about what I can do as an individual now, whilst we wait for minds and hearts to change in terms of political... Yeah, um, the subtitle of the book is Why We Need Principled capitalism. If you have an economic system, then you're going to have some form of capitalism because mm-hmm. it's it's just a way in which we exchange things. I'm proposing that, I've written a couple of papers about this as well as the book, yeah. I'm proposing that we understand our inter- economic interactions through our mutual obligations to each other and the natural world. And those obligations are based on moral virtues. Now, currently, they're not. Profit is everything, it seems. Although, of course, there are lots of people talking about the green economy and the circular economy and the triple bottom line and so on. I think I illustrate how we're lacking on this front by uh, the golden rule. Many people perhaps know what the golden rule is. It is just simply uh, do as you would be done by, or abstrusely, but more effectively, don't do to others that you would not have them do to you. Now, uh, in family life, generally, in a good family, uh, that's how we operate. But some families don't operate like that. They tend to have problems and they start telling each other fibs and so on. Sometimes in the guise of a white lie, but often just straight lying. Uh, At company, organisational and international political level, it barely uh, sees the the light of day. Now, uh, the interesting thing is all the world's religion, if you look at writers like Karen Armstrong who've written about the world's religions, you will find that 
hidden in those religions. The golden rule is in every one. Now, that's got to be important. And even if you're not religious, it's just sheer common sense. We know that in our everyday interactions, if we're kind to each other people, they will be kind back again. If you smile at people, they'll smile back again. It's all part of that kind of idea. So that's the first thing. The second thing is debt. Now this is where you get into macroeconomics. What puzzled me when I started thinking about this was this Every day we hear on the news that every country seems to be in debt. How can we all be in debt? Somebody must be positive somewhere, surely. Uh, that was the conundrum. That is certainly so for individuals. If we get into debt, then we're in trouble uh, because we've got bills to pay and in the end we perhaps end up being bankrupt or something. But it doesn't apply to countries. I, and I came across something called modern monetary theory. Yeah. which is shortened to MMT. MMT. Now, MMT is controversial in economics. It's a theory of macroeconomics, not microeconomics. That's the, the big picture stuff. Uh, the, the, the work that influenced me most was by a lady called Stephanie yeah. Kelton called The Deficit Myth. Anyone interested in MMT should start by reading her book. It's a bestseller. It's extremely well written and very well argued. Now, she's a powerful lady, and she was a, an advisor to Bernie Saunders, the American politician, for a number of years. Why is it that countries can have so much debt, and what is the nature of debt? Now, Stephanie said that this is the deficit myth. We're told that the government's borrowing money, you know, heading towards doomsday because of the, of, of the debt. The first thing to really understand is that Governments are not like individuals because governments issue currency. We as individuals use currency. Now, they call it fiat to money. The word fiat means by decree. In other words, the money has the value by decree. Now, what does that mean? It means it depends on the strength of the economy of the country that's issuing the currency. So uh, this is why uh, the UK economy, the American economy, the Australian economy, uh, J the Japanese economy, all fiat currencies, plus there are a number of others, are so important. If the economy is strong, then the currency is strong. So uh, in any economic exchange, then there are three parties involved. The person who is paying out the money, the currency, mm -hmm. the person receiving it. But the third party is the government that's issuing that currency. I couldn't suddenly start making currency. And the reason is that if somebody said to you, Sabrina, mm -hmm. I'll pay you in David Blockley's currency, you'd say, who's David Blockley? And then how, how I, do I know? Yeah. that this is worth anything, because it, it isn't. <laughs> no. What is important is that the country that issues the currency mm -hmm. can issue as much as it likes. It's not uh, constrained at all, um, except by the strength of its economy. So if it issues currency willy-nilly mm -hmm. without paying any attention to the current, to the strength of the economy, you get money floating around and you get rampant inflation. And that's what's happened in, uh, in Germany, it's happened yeah. in Argentina, it's happened recently in Sri Lanka. So you've got to have a strong underlying economy. You've got to know that the demand and supply can balance. But given that, then the government can just conjure money out of thin air. Uh, how does it do that? Well, it, it sells government bonds. So that's what they call government okay. borrowing. They don't actually need to do that, but they do it because there's a law in most countries to say that they have to. So they, they, they have to do it by law. Uh, and of course, when they uh, issue these bonds, they pay the people who buy the bonds an interest. So you say, well, where does the interest come from? Well, they sell some more bonds to cover it. It can go on forever. Now, Stephanie Kelton points this out. Now, it's not her original theory, although she developed it. Uh, it goes way back. But it is not accepted by very large parts of the community of economists. And yet, when you look mm -hmm. at the accounting, if you look carefully at how banks deal with money, mm -hmm. it, it all stands up. Mm -hmm. it, 
it really is very powerful and it changes your view of debt and so it, it says that if you want to fund the nhs better as long as it doesn't involve foreign currency uh, because remember it doesn't apply to foreign currency if, if you print more pounds it doesn't affect the dollar other than in the trading of the pounds to dollars yes. on the uh, currency market this is why governments can suddenly conjure up large sums of money. Yeah, so they were able to do that during COVID and now we're, is it high inflation or high inflation caused by selling off our bonds? We missed the chance to do something yeah. to prevent the inflation when the prices started rising. Uh, the problem with the current inflation is due to energy inputs mm -hmm. and we can't influence that by printing money. Okay. Because we buy that oil in dollars. Okay. So if we're not careful, then uh, you deflate the pound against the dollar. Okay. So that kind of inflation can't be handled this way. But what you can do is internally help to alleviate the effects of the inflation on the population, as long as it's internal. So there's something about, well, the modern monetary theory and understanding debt and how governments can essentially help that by printing our own money if it's internal issues that we do have how does that one of that concept link to the bit about climate change and how the economy can support that well in the book i suggest that principal capitalism mm -hmm. is based on 10 pillars uh, foundations, if you like, uh, principles. Um, <clears throat> and the MMT is one of them, yeah. not the only one. So I think a new understanding of economics like uh, MMT will help. Mm -hmm. It doesn't solve the problem, of course. Uh, but it, it does suggest that we can invest much more doing the things we need to do in order to um, alleviate climate change, the effects of climate change. MMT is one of the pillars. Well, yeah. uh, we mentioned another pillar, which is um, the golden rule the golden, and yeah. an, a new way of thinking about ourselves and about our relationships with other people and, in, of course, with the natural world. We've made a lot of progress on the natural world, but, mm -hmm. you know, we still go to the supermarkets and buy stuff in plastic packets, don't we? Uh, and that's polluting the, the ocean and all sorts. We need to invest money in order to deal with that. Other examples are electric cars, mm -hmm. El elect electrifying the transport network uh, requires charging points. That won't happen until the government starts to invest itself and encourage private investment into uh, providing charging points. People won't buy electric cars in large numbers until they know they can charge them when they go on a long journey. Uh, domestic heating is another example where, you know, we're still reliant largely on gas boilers. The government talk a lot about to heat. Um, they're useless in houses like mine, which is drafty. Although I've got double glazing and insulated roof, I know that uh, that kind of, that form of heating won't, won't uh, be sufficient for my house. So what are the other pillars? Being citizens of the world, mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you want to know what you can do individually for that, go to John Alexander's website. There are others, but it gives you all sorts of tips about what you can do for example working in the community you know people who go out picking up litter mm -hmm. wow. wonderful people spend their time doing that yeah. that's that's a trivial thing a small thing but it's it's helpful uh, and getting to know your neighbors and, be, and being being part of a community but most importantly not just seeing yourself as a citizen of your little local community or indeed the region obviously we are both living in england yeah. which is part of the uk so uh, to me the uk is important as a group and i hope scotland don't succeed from that but then we are still part of europe 
I don't mean the European yeah. Union. Yeah. I mean, Europe as a landmark, but Europe is part of the West and the West is part of the world. To see ourselves in layers like that. Now, we mentioned system, that's another pillar, yeah. systems thinking. And there's something I call practical wisdom, which he had a name for it, which is phrenesis. And you can read a lot about it. Again, if you want to know more, Google, just Google. Practical wisdom is is one translation of the world word phrenesis. What I'm saying is that it's something that we've lost. Because we've pursued academic excellence, we tend to see vocational skills as yeah. something less. So if you're a plumber, let's face it, you look down upon a bit compared to if you're a professor like me. But uh, when I was younger, I used to do a bit of plumbing. <laughs> and building because that's the engineer in me but practical skills are incredibly important this loss of the value of people who and, and the best chartered engineers the real the really top engineers mm -hmm. people who design things like the london eye the shard in london mm -hmm. the, the engineering of that requires great intellect but also a lot of practical understanding of how things fit together now, yeah. I think that's the same in, in medicine, isn't it? Yeah. If you're going to be a, a top consultant, you've got to know what it's like to do the things that you ask your staff. Okay. Yeah. That's what I call practical wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another part of systems thinking. Investment is another pillar. And, uh, of course, engineering, the word, divide, derives from the idea of ingenuity. It stems from the same Latin word, engineering, in, ingenuity. Now, not many people think of engineers as ingenious, <laughs> ingenuity, do they? But, yeah. in fact, that's the derivation. The history of it is that it, it came about after the... Uh, Renaissance had two aspects to building, what they looked like and how they stood up. Mm -hmm. So you, you got the separation between the architect and the engineer, the craftsman. Uh, and in the early days, craftsmen was just craftsmen. And they did it by the seat of the pumps and built enormous Gothic cathedrals for incredible innovation and ingenuity to do that. But as science developed and when you, you can't design the shard without... A, a real understanding of engineering science. Uh, so you've got to bring ingenuity, uh, innovation and intelligence all together. So I, I think um, the idea of teaching children to think more broadly, which Edward de Bono used to promote, yeah. um, <clears throat> is important. I'd, I'd rather like to see schools have lessons in math, science and thinking. I, think. uh, I, I actually did... Um, benefit enormously mm. when I was in the sixth form at school by one of my more enlightened teachers, English teacher, who, mm. but he used to spend an hour uh, lesson um, getting us to think. He'd give us a problem of the day and he'd get us to think around it. And basically, he asked us who, what, why, where, when and how. Mm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the the next pillar is dealing with fake news. Um, I think that's a real scourge. Uh, and part of that is to do mm -hmm. with helping people and teaching people at school to uh, separate the information wheat from the chaff. Uh, and scientific evidence is part of that. So uh, that's a big problem, which uh, I, I think we've just really got to get grasp with. Their unscrupulous people are using it to um, defraud and uh, get money from other people. And I think that's, that's terrible. Inequality is another mm -hmm. pillar. Uh, again, we've got to use the economic system to reduce inequality. In fact, inequality uh, is accelerating. There's an economist called Thomas Piketty, a Frenchman, who wrote a lot about this and gave all the facts and figures. Again, he, his book is available. He shows it's getting worse. Now, this is a matter of policy making by government. I don't see it slowing down, it's getting mm -hmm. worse. And I, I really get quite upset when I hear footballers being paid millions of pounds per year. I understand why in the capitalist system, mm -hmm. because it's supply and demand. Lots of people yeah. go to the matches and pay enormous amounts to TV companies to watch them. Yeah. Because they're good. They, you know, I love yeah. soccer myself. 
Yeah. And I love to watch um, Messi play uh, football. It's really, really good. But is it right that we pay him that amount of money when a nurse is living on a pittance yeah. and a cleaner who keeps the toilets clean in a public building gets more or less nothing? I, I just think that's a scandal. That's yeah. part of principal capitalism. We don't just think of it in terms of of money and profit. We think of it in terms of value yeah. and obligation to each other. And then finally, the final pillar is mm -hmm. corruption. Uh, I think this is perhaps the biggest pillar, yeah. uh, the biggest problem of all. Yes, in the UK, there is some, but in some countries, it's rampant. Yeah, we and um, as you know, loads of people watching will not just be from the UK, they'll be from other countries. I come from the Caribbean. And I know that is, you know, sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know, and that shouldn't be the way that things are, yeah, are done. Yeah, there's a lot of nepotism, isn't there? Yeah. Now, that's part of uh, what I say about uh, squabbling and fiddling with the deck chairs on the Titanic. Can, they, can we get those people to see, whilst they may be getting an immediate gain, we as a human race are, make, uh, uh, are suffering, yeah. or could suffer, or will suffer, are suffering through floods and, and the wildfires and things from the climate change, which is partly ex accelerated by <coughs> corruption. You know, I'm not minimising the problem. It's enormous. We've got to see this as, this as an opportunity to really change the way we think about ourselves and each other and the natural world. It's, it's a big ask, but it may be the only ask that we've got left. Yeah. And if we fail, certainly life as we know it will not be the same. There may be only a few people left, or we may extinguish the human race altogether. That sounds dramatic, doesn't it? What I've heard is people have said, we know there is not a planet B, so we need to take care of the one that we yeah. have. Good way said, of putting there's, it. there's things within our gift that we can do to go about doing that and also yeah. influence and use, whether that's our vote or you know, our community and do simple things in our community, we can then impress upon people that represent us in government that these are some of the things that we want um, so that we can leave the planet in a better place for those that come after us. We've got to, we've got to put pressure on our politicians. They're the people who can make the difference. And I have to say, um, in America, they seem to be doing a lot better after Biden's got in. The, he did invest a large amount of money, he is investing a large yeah. amount of money, and they are attracting green uh, industries to the US. Why aren't we doing the same in the UK? As I said earlier, the, the obvious things like electrification of transport uh, and home heating are two simple things that, uh, that we need to see action on now. Well, um, David, there's so much that we can unpack in other videos but obviously um you've written the book when will it be when will it be published and where can people well it, it? it's being published by crc press which is based in america and part of the taylor and francis group i am only just about to receive the proofs so we're early on this yeah yeah i haven't actually got the proofs yet at the earliest to the end of 2023 but i think it will be some time early or mid-2024, before it actually appears. I am thinking that I might try to produce an audio, okay. but I'm asking the publishers about that at this very moment. So if I can, I, I think I'll try to do that. And then videos like this might help yeah. to get the message across. But there's a lot of literature, all the things I've mentioned, systems thinking, MMT, hmm. uh, being a citizen of the world, there's all sorts of, if you Google those things, uh, you know, how to deal with inequality, dealing with fake news, uh, rooting out corruption, lots of people are writing and thinking about this. So there's an enormous, an enormous amount of material out there. If anyone wants to follow it up, it's there. But the, my message is this imperative that we, if we really, really understand what we're facing, we will want to change, because if we don't, that will maybe the end of us. 
certainly it be the end of life as we know it. Well, thank you very much, David, for such an enlightening talk. There's so much there to you know go and, and look up. But thank, thanks again. And for those that um, have listened, I will put the information about David's website and the um, suggested reading that he's um, asked us to look, look into. And do leave any questions, comments um, below. And we'll see you later. Let's be bold and brave together. Thank you very much for Sabrina. I enjoyed that very much. Hi, guys. Have you been wondering how you might diversify your career? as a nurse but not sure how to do so. In today's video I'm going to do something different um, and I hope you can take some lessons away from this video because I'll have the pleasure of interviewing Emeritus Professor Dr David Blockley on his new book. Dr Blockley is a structural engineer uh, by background but over the years due to his curiosity he's written a number of books in his chosen career field but also more recently he became really curious around the economy around climate change and has used his past experience as a structural engineer to write a book that looks at the economy and um, climate change and what we can do practically as citizens um, within the video we have um, Dr. Blockley, Dr Blockley has tried to include some examples from the NHS so that you can see the synergies of how um, what he's, he's done. But what I think is really interesting is that he's been able to use his skills, knowledge and years of experience um, as a structural engineer to write many books around his chosen field but to broaden that into his new books. And I think that's really important for us as nurses, not only just being um, aware of what we can do um, to help around climate change, but also how we might want to combine our skills, knowledge as a nurse and our passions to create something new, different and exciting. So do stick around, um, watch till the end of the video, leave your comments, because we hope to be, if um, digging deeper into some of the concepts and pillars that Dr. Blockley has put in his book. See you all soon.